Welcome to CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. G. Marshall. I'd rather be handsome than homely. I'd rather be youthful than old. If I can't have a bushel of silver, I'll do with a barrel of gold. So said a gentleman named James Roach. And who is to say that he has not expressed the basic philosophy of mankind? Or put it this way, as we're about to do. Take the cash and let the credit go. You're saying we should commit a robbery, Julie? Yes, Chris. Now, I was pretty definite and specific, I thought. Well, is this why we went to college? Obviously, we didn't learn how to make a living there. But, Julie... We did learn how to study. And, Chris, I have really given careful thought and study to how this can be done. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Big Ten Cent Hustle, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Earl Hammond. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Would you, by any chance, happen to remember the clarion call of the Barker? Step right up, ladies and gentlemen, and for ten cents, one dime, the tenth part of a dollar... Oh, yes. And for that ten-cent piece, there was the promise of delights far beyond your wildest expectations. In those days, the dime was a coin of substance, a piece of money to be taken seriously. Well, while we cannot turn back the clock, it is possible, now and then, here and there, to find a dime that's worth far more than its face value. And such a one is the double thirty-four. And what is the double 34? Well, why not let it tell its own story? That's right. We're to have a story told by a dime, as if that inanimate piece of metal could actually think and speak. Why not? Listen. I was bored, or would you prefer I said May? So how about Minty? In 1934, I was one of, oh, I don't know, 30, 40 million. We all looked exactly alike. We were called Mercury Dimes because everybody thought our face was that of the ancient Greek god Mercury wearing a winged helmet. But it wasn't. It was just the goddess Liberty. We all wore that face plus the word Liberty and the motto... In God we trust. And underneath her neck, we had our date, 1934. Except me. I had 1934 stamped on me twice. How did that happen? Why was my date stamped twice? Well, the machinery was going full speed at the mix. There. Did you hear it? For the tiniest fraction of a second, something got stuck. And I was held in place for just a fraction of an instant too long. And so my date was stamped on me for a second time. But who noticed? There were millions of us. We were gathered together and stacked and packed and shipped all over the country. And we were, I guess you could say, funneled into banks and out into the world. The class of 1934. I could have gone anywhere, into anyone's pocket. I found myself in a bag with about a hundred of my fellows. And I saw the light of day for the first time on a marble tabletop. And 
I could see I was in a home. A mansion. A place of enormous wealth and grandeur. I heard voices. One young, brisk. The other old, incredibly aged. Sir? Yes, Treskit, what is it? Your dime, sir. My, my dime? It's a good day today, sir. Is it? The doctor says you should go out. Well, all right, all right. It's good for you. Ah, Treskit. Treskit, at my age, nothing is good for you. Well, sir, you should show your face. Why? For public relations. Public relations, you say? You happen to be the richest man in the world. Uh, in a few weeks, a month, a year or two, perhaps, I shall be no richer than anyone else. Let me put the dimes in this little purse for you, sir. Ah, the dimes. It's something that the public has come to expect from you. Yeah. This little gesture of handing out dimes to the people, it does your image no end of good. A dime... I remember, Treskit. I was a very young man. I worked all day. I chopped wood for 14 hours. And all over a dime. D did you know that? Now, Adams, we'll make sure you're bundled up warmly. And we're off for an airing. Don't make it sound as if you're walking a dog, Treskit. <laughs> He was, as I have already told you, an old man, an incredibly old man. Slowly, assisted on either side by nurses and servants, he walked, or should I say, tottered from the door of his magnificent mansion to the door of his magnificent limousine. Over here, sir. Over here. And suddenly, a crowd had gathered. Hands were extended. And as he moved towards his motor car, he would reach into his purse for a dime. Then extend his arm slowly and drop the coin into someone's waiting, expectant palm. I was lifted out of the sack, and I felt myself being gripped feverishly. Then I was in a pocket. And I was all alone. Any luck? Lots of luck. All of it bad. Oh. What are we going to do, Joe? Nothing's coming in. Maggie, old girl, cheer up. Something did come in today. See? A nice, brand new, shiny dime. A dime? Maybe it'll be a charm. Yeah. I was walking down the street, you know, and I passed by the old man's mansion. Mm -hmm. And he came out. And, you know, he's always handing out dimes. Well, he can afford it. He's got millions. Well, you got to admit it's nice of him. Oh, we better be careful. He may go broke. Wait a minute. Just wait a minute. What's the matter? He sure won't go broke giving out dimes like this one. What do you mean? This dime's no good. It, it looks to be okay. Oh, yeah? Look closer. See? What? The date on it, the 1934. Oh, what about it? Oh. Yeah, sure. It's marked twice. Oh, that means it's damaged goods, huh? I guess when your luck is out, it's out all the way. Oh, does that mean we can't use this dime? I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe we can pass it off on somebody. Oh, Joe, let's quit this crazy talk about a dime. What are we going to do? I don't know. I just don't know. Well, will Conrad wait for his money on the truck? It's more than just a truck. We owe for the fruit. Oh, it wasn't your fault. The roads were washed out. Nobody could get through. If you want to be in the trucking business, nobody wants to hear your hard luck stories. They just want the merchandise delivered on time. But Joe... That truck was a total wreck. But your insurance... My insurance is only so I can pay the other guy if I hit him. If I crack up myself, I'm out of luck. Maybe you shouldn't have gone into business... Now, isn't that just what your father said? Just because he's my father, did that mean he had to be wrong? I'm sorry, Joe. I, I, I shouldn't have said that. The worst of it is... I'm going to be listening to him saying, I told you so. Mm. Well, how, how much money do we need? I figure, oh, 2000 2000 Yeah. <laughs> Might just as well be... Two million. Well, I, I could ask him. No. Joe, 
It means so much to you to have the truck and the payoff. That's why you can't ask your father. He'd give it to you. With no strings attached? Well? Uh, I, I guess not. What do you have in your purse? <laughs> Nothing. You? All I have right now is that broken down dime. I did have two cents, but I bought a newspaper. Why? Is there any good news anywhere? I, I bought the paper, Joe, just so I, I could look at the want ads. Oh? Hey, Joe, our jobs, they're still open. Well, what are you saying? Our jobs. Well, they're not our jobs. He keeps advertising them. It means he must be hiring couples and firing them. He's not satisfied. Who cares? Oh, please, Joe. Look, my wife is not going to be amazed. I don't mind. I thought we were through with all that working for rich people. Ah. <sighs> Back to the old grind, huh? Me, the chauffeur and handyman, and you, the maid. Housekeeper, this time. What do you mean, this time? Well, I saw Mr. Mears today. You what? Yeah, I, I walked over to his place. How could you go back there after we quit? Look, I, I said to him, we're the best couple you ever had, Mr. Mears, and we're willing to come back. Maggie. He'll give us the same money. <sighs> Joe. Honey, we haven't any choice. So, when do we start? Tonight. Tonight? Yeah, I thought we'd get there before supper. Or else we could hock your watch and buy our own groceries. All right, all right. You win. Well, we're going to walk to our place of employment and get there in time for supper. What do you say we start? <laughs> You can drive the car back tomorrow and pick up our things. Yeah. Say goodbye to this place. You know, I thought this was going to be a lucky dime. Well, maybe it will be one day. Let's keep it. Sure. And I'll tell you how broke we are. We can't even afford to throw away a worthless ten-cent piece. That's us. Once again, I was in his pocket. I know you don't don't believe a word of this, but it's true. You know, everything that's made exists for a purpose. Mine was to be worth ten cents. And here, I was being told I was worth nothing. Well, I was brand new, inexperienced, ignorant. How did I know that was a completely false statement of my true value? Well... They were walking down the street, Joe and Maggie. I was still in his pocket. You, you really don't mind going back into service? Could be that's what I was meant for. Oh, Joe, don't say that. Maybe I don't have the head or the talent for business. You're as smart as most of them. Hey, stop a minute. Yeah? Well, what is it? I know what I want to do with this dime. Hmm? I'm going to give it to that beggar sitting against the building. You know, the one selling the pencils? He's not selling them. He just has them for show. He don't dare take one. Help a poor man. Help a poor man. Oh, poor man. Help Listen poor to man. him. I've seen that one around. They say he has stocks and bonds and owns apartment buildings. Help a poor man, a poor unfortunate sick old man. Do you know why I want him to have this damn baby? All right. Tell me. Because the second I drop this into his tin cup... We will be flat broke. We will not have a penny in the world. Bless you, bless you. Thank you kindly. A dime. Do they think I'm in business for my health? A dime. And now, I disappeared into a greasy sack where I made the acquaintance of some other coins for the first time. Pennies, nickels, quarters. But I must say, none were as shiny, new, or as sprightly handsome as me. At the end of the day, we went to the home of my new owner. He was called, or even referred to himself, as the moocher. Evidently, he had a great deal of money, both silver and paper, and even gold. We were all spread out on the table, and he liked to pick us up one by one. He picked me up, and he looked at me very closely, this ugly, unkempt, malodorous man. 
Evidently, he liked my face better than I liked his, because he clutched me very tightly. Oh, I, I don't believe it. I can't believe it. Oh, why not? It's true. Don't I have the evidence right here? Yeah, hello? Is this Fallowfield's coin shop? You, Mr. Fallowfield? You know me. The moocher. We've we done business before. Now, uh, look, I, uh, I got a new uncirculated 1934 Mercury dime. You follow this? Now, uh, it's got a double date. Yeah, you heard me. How much? Two thousand dollars. I'll think about it. Two thousand dollars. Well, you knew that all along. Certainly you knew it would be worth more, far more than the face value of ten cents. And the money represents only a fraction of the true value. Think of what it's already been worth to us in terms of sheer drama. And this is only the end of Act One. If only we knew where fortune hides, the place where hidden wealth abides. But desert waste and ocean deeps, the silent secret stubborn keeps. Yes, well, perhaps. Who says that fortune must be found in a desert or beneath the sea or on a remote mountaintop? This is the story of a dime that happens to be worth $2,000 at first appraisal. And it seems quite capable of telling its own story. $2,000? Hmm. Yeah, the fact, Mr. Fallowfield. $2,000. <laughs> well, I'll think about your offer. $2,000. Oh, $2,000. He picked up a greasy rag. He rubbed me with it. And he kept repeating, $2,000. Well, it wasn't very long before I heard a knock on the door. Quickly, he gathered all the money together and locked us in a drawer. Who's there? It's me, Fowlfield. What do you want? You know what I want. Ah, oh, come on, Mooch, let me in. You alone? Yeah, sure. Who'd be with me? Uh, what's the matter, Mooch? Oh, come in and leave me shut the door. Yeah, it's a bit peculiar in your old age. Mm, a fella can't be too careful. Of what? Crooks. Who want to rob you, Mooch? <laughs> Who? Uh, say, I guess it's true. What's true? What everybody says. What does everybody say? That you're a millionaire. Me? You got limousines, apartment houses, stocks. Oh, they're crazy. Probably. I, I got a bag on the streets for my living. Oh, well, yeah. I get coins. So I, I look at them. Maybe here and there one can be worth a couple pennies more than it says in the face, right? Oh, right as rain. Oh, so I put a few cents away in the bank. But it's for my old age, right? Sure. Now a man's got to worry about his old age, don't he? Where's that dime? The uh, dime? Come on. I don't mind you playing a little bit hard to get, but my time's valuable. Uh, okay. I'll leave you a look at her. He was one of those sharp-featured, sparse-haired men who wore thin, wire-rimmed glasses. A fellow you would hate to have to do business with because you knew he would always come out on top. He held me between his fingers. He peered at me. Oh, you could withhold no secrets from a searching gaze like that. Finally... He put me down. I said 2500 Okay? Well... Well, what? I don't know. Now, listen, Mooch. The law of supply and demand hasn't yet had a chance to operate on this coin. You understand? No. It's brand new. The market doesn't know about it yet. 
Maybe it'll never be worth more than a dime. Oh, now that ain't true, and you know it. I'm taking a risk buying it for 25. I'm taking a risk selling it. Ah. Uh, well, what do you take for it, Mooch? Mm, more than 25. How much more? Oh, what are you going to do? Go shopping around? You can't do that. No, why? You know why? You're supposed to be a penniless beggar. Now, you want to work to get out that you're making the rounds with a dime worth all that money? <laughs> I don't think so. I say you better stick with me. I keep my mouth shut about your financial situation. Now, that has got to be worth a great deal for you. Well, don't give me the right to cheat a poor man. I got a favorite customer. I'll see what she'll offer. Have we got a deal? <laughs> Mr. Mears' residence. Who's calling, please? Oh, just one minute. Mr. Mears. Yes, what is it, Maggie? Uh, do you wish to speak to a, a Mr. Fallowfield? Uh, Fallowfield. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. <clears> hey, <throat> uh, Fallowfield. What have you got for me today? A what? Mm, yes, it does sound interesting. How much? <laughs> now, listen, Fallowfield. I know you're entitled to your profit. But don't think you can get rich on me alone. Well, tomorrow is Sunday, and neither one of us could transact business on Sabbath, wouldn't you say? <laughs> well, uh, pick it up from your fellow on Monday and bring it down to my office. <laughs> right. Uh, goodbye. It's just fantastic. Uh, I beg your pardon? It is the most fantastic thing. A double 1934. I, I, I beg your pardon, sir. Uh, well, do, you, uh, do you know anything about coins, Maggie? Well, sir, I know one from another. Uh, it can be very interesting and very valuable. If you know what to look for. I suppose so. Uh, now, uh, <laughs> Mr. Fallowfield, he's the new mesmetist. Sir? Uh, he's an expert in coins. Oh, oh. He has a shop. Buys and sells them. Yeah, I see. Well... He knows where he can get hold of a brand new Mercury dime. <laughs> the date is stamped twice. Twice? Yes, Maggie. <laughs> twice? Yeah, something must have been faulty with one of the presses in the mint. <sighs> but you see, we're close to the end of the year, and no one has discovered any other coins that were stamped twice. So this is one in a million, or I should say one in 30 uh, or 40 million. Or uh, however many were turned out. And 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 you say it's it's worth. Well, in the long run, Maggie, no one could safely say at this time just what it could be worth. But I'd gamble three or four thousand or so on it right here and now. Three or four thousand. Maggie, Maggie, are you all right? <laughs> Give three or four thousand? Maybe more. I can't believe it. Believe it. It's true. How could we know? <sighs> what are we going to do about it? How could we know? There's so many things in this world I just don't know about. I never realized what an ignorant man I was. Answer the question. Well, what question? What are we going to do about it? You talk as if there's something we can do about it. It's our dime. Ours? Yeah, ours. What are you saying? We gave it away. We didn't know what we were doing. Well, that's... That's what? Ah, uh, tough luck? Yes. I would guess so. No. No, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have to pay for it. We always have to pay for our mistakes, Maggie. I want a dime. But it's ours no longer. Joe, listen to me. Listen to me for once. Now, go out and get what belongs to you. But it doesn't belong to me. Get that dime back. Get that you go to a store, <sighs> you buy something, you give the man a big bill instead of a small one. You discover your error. The man gives you your money back, if he's honest. Now, same thing here. And if that beggar isn't an honest man, let him take the consequences. What consequences? Here. Here's a dime. A brand new, shiny, mercury dime. But it's only got one date. It's only worth ten cents. Do you see? Maggie, Take you... it to him. Say to him, uh, uh, here, here's the dime we meant to give you. Maggie. You've got to do it, Joe. You've got to. But what if he just laughs in my face? What then, huh? Then 
Well, then I don't know. That, that'll be... It'll be up to you. What'll be up to me? The next move. Do you know what you're talking about? Oh, maybe there won't be a next move. I don't know. It'll depend on how you feel. What do you want? I want to come in. Hey, you, you can't just... Okay, I'm in. Shut the door. Who are you? I'll shut it for you. No, no, no. I'll yell for the cop. I wouldn't try that. Just shut up. Oh, look, you got, you got it all wrong. You, you, you've been listening to all kinds of crazy talk. I ain't rich. I, I don't have any dough hidden away. I can just about get enough to eat. I didn't come here to steal your money. I don't care if you got a million bucks stashed away. Oh, 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 what do you want? You remember me? Oh, I've never seen you before in my whole life. Just the day before yesterday, I was walking past you with my wife. Oh, a lot of guys walk past me with their wives. And I dropped a dime in your cup. A dime. A very special dime. Oh, what would be so special about a dime? I made a mistake. I gave you the wrong dime. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry about it. I that. want it back. I I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. You know the dime I'm talking no, about. No, no, I don't. You even making arrangements to sell it. Well, you can't. It's more. Oh, you, you take take your hands off of me. Give me that dime. Let go of me. Let go. Hand it over. No, I don't. I don't hand it over. Oh, it's no. mine. No. Hand it over, or I'll kill you. Well, this is Joe. Good-natured, mild-mannered Joe. About whom it was said, in the ordinary way, butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Yes, indeed. Money. Money can do it to all of us. Money is the philosopher's stone. Money can change us overnight, on the spot. What sort of change has it wrought in Joe? For that, we need the third act, which I shall deliver presently. We shall fish the stream of life, said the poet, with silken lines and silver hooks. We don't have any silver hooks for you at this time, but we do have a silver coin. Actually, it's a dime, a mercury dime, made of pure, well, almost pure silver. 900 parts of the precious metal alloyed to 100 parts copper. Good enough, especially since this particular coin is worth far more than 10 cents for reasons we've been talking about. No. <laughs> Give me half time. I'll give you another one. I I don't have it. Give it to me. He he was here, huh? Who was here? The man. Please <laughs> let go of me. Wait a minute. The coin guy. A lie. And I swear he just I'll turn this place upside down, inside out. It ain't here. I'll kill you. Listen. I don't care. I'm not going to stay a working stiff all my life. I'll get that coin even if I have to kill you. But he was here. I, I told you the guy was here already. I say you're lying. He, he, he took the dime with him. Hey. Hey, look. Talk to me. Say something. I, I, I didn't do nothing. I, I didn't do nothing. I didn't, I didn't kill you. I didn't. I was just holding on to him, Maggie. I wasn't choking him or anything. I know, Joe. I know. He just died. It happened. Sure, it happened. Yeah. He must have had a heart attack. Huh? It's exactly what it was, a heart attack. Look, I, I, I threatened him, sure. But when I would have come down to it, I wouldn't have killed him. Of course you wouldn't. But, but I did. No, no, Joe. He died of a heart attack. How did he get the heart attack? I gave it to him. Joe, 
You can't blame yourself. Oh? Who else am I going to blame? You can blame me. No. You had nothing to do with it. I should have left you alone. I, I steamed you up. No, no, no. I wanted to do it. I had to do it. I had to prove I could just go out there and take. But every time I try, it always goes wrong somehow. And now, I killed a guy. Since I'm telling a story, in addition to being a dime, I'm also a poet. And I enjoy poetic license. And that's what I claim for the scene you just heard between Joe and Maggie. But the scene between Joe and the moocher? Oh, uh -huh. I was there in a sack on the moocher's table. And not half an hour after the distraught Joe left the premises, there was a knock on the door. Moosh? Moosh? No? Oh, that's funny. He never leaves the door open. Mooch? Uh, Mooch, where are... Oh. Mooch? Ah. Uh, well, it's too bad. Perhaps, Mooch, if you'd led a more exemplary life... He would have died within the bosom of a large and loving family instead of all alone on the filthy floor of a miserable hovel. And the money, Mooch, the money you so miserly accumulated, what's to become of it now, huh? What's to become of it? Were you ever able to hear a person think? Really? Well, I did, because the next thing I knew, the sack that I was in, with all the coins and bills and stocks and bonds, found itself under Mr. Fallowfield's arm. And we were off and away. What a world. Oh, what a world. Mr. Mears, please. Ah, this is Miss Fallowfield. I believe you expected my call. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Ah, yes, yeah, Miss Mears. Uh, the coin awaits your inspection, sir. What, uh, tomorrow after the close of business? Or say, 6 p.m.? <laughs> sir, I'll be at your doorstep on the button. Oh, yes, yes, the coin's beauty. Lovely, magnificent. What? Oh, there's no trouble about price, sir, we'll... Haggle a bit for the sake of form, but we shall arrive at a most equitable arrangement. As usual. Mm. That was Monday morning. I now was resting in Mr. Fallowfield's safe. And so I was unable to witness what you're about to hear next. But once again, I was able to put it all together by the way it ended. It seems we are dealing with two new folk. Chris and Julie. Hey, you know who's playing first trumpet on that arrangement? No, and I don't care. Hey, what'd you turn it off for? How much longer do you intend to sit around and listen to those records? Hey, Julie, I have to listen to those records. Why, Chris? Why? Well, because sooner or later I'll get an assignment to write a piece about them. I know, but I've watched as sooner turned to later. And now I believe that later is going to become never. Now, Julie, we can't lose hope. You'll never get a writing assignment. Come on, don't say that. There are no jobs. Look, experienced writers, people with credits, even they're out of work. Everybody's starting to talk about the WPA thing. Oh, I still believe... Oh, I... sure. Meanwhile, the government's talking about putting everybody on the dole. Well, I, I don't know what to do. Look out the window. At what? shop across the street. Well, what about it? What does the sign say? What's the difference? Read it. Frederick Fallowfield, coins. So? So, every now and then Mr. Fallowfield comes out of that shop. 
He locks the door. He has a little velvety-looking sack in his hand. He puts the sack into his pocket. Do you know why? No, but I don't care. Pay attention. Julie, what are you driving at? He has some valuable gold and silver coins that he's taking to a customer. Okay. And they have to be worth a couple of hundred, maybe a, a thousand dollars. So? Follow him. Wait till you get to a, a more or less deserted spot. Pretend you have a gun. And... Do you know what you're saying? Sure. <laughs> well, how can you say it? Well, it isn't easy. You want me to uh, uh, commit a robbery, a holdup? Yes. And the only reason I want you to do it is because I can. Oh, no, Julie, that's not what we went to college for. So what did we go to college for, Chris? Well, I wanted to be a musicologist, and you? Yes. I wanted to be a lawyer. Well, we have to keep trying. Chris. Honey, wake up. We don't have any choice. Now, wait a minute. I, I don't want to have a theoretical argument about ethics and how people can be driven to crime by circumstance. All I know is it's wrong. Of course it's wrong. And what else are we going to do? Besides the baby... Oh. What baby? Our baby. Julie. Yes, Chris. A baby. Julie, I... <sighs> I'm so happy. I need money for a doctor, for everything that, that a baby means. But surely to, to hold up that man across the street. I suggest him for a reason. We know the situation. It's not like going into a bank or a store or anything like that. Julie, I... I... Get a ten-cent cap pistol, okay? Use a handkerchief. Tie it around your face, up under your eyes. But what if, uh... Yeah, what if it goes wrong? Hmm. Okay. You'll be caught. But, Chris, the times are going for you. We'll get some sob sister reporter to write a real tearjerker. You know how they eat it up. Well, um... Father-to-be, desperate for his wife and expected child, forced to commit hold-up. And you didn't really mean to hurt anybody. Your gun was a toy. Yeah, yeah, that figures. You even risked your life, because if your so-called victim were armed, he could have killed you. Hey, that's a point. And, and say you're caught. You go to trial. And uh, who will be your lawyer? You. Yes, me, your pregnant wife. Hmm. I ask you, Chris. Will there be a dry eye on that jury in that courtroom anywhere in these United States? Hey, you know what? We'll even get job offers from all over. Maybe it even pays to get caught. No, I, I figure what's in that sack he'll carry can be worth as much as a thousand. That'll keep us for a while. <laughs> Julie, you're a genius. Oh, darling, go downstairs and buy a cap pistol. Chris? Yeah. Now. Now? He just turned out the lights in the store. Well, maybe he's closing for the day. If... Put on your coat and have the pistol and the handkerchief ready. He's not closing up for good. He stays open until eight. It's only a quarter to six. It means he's taking something to a customer. Yeah, okay. How do you feel? Great, just great. You sure, Chris? Yeah, don't worry. Remember now, we figured it all out. He goes down the street, past the alley. Uh-huh. Now, if you go out the back way, you can get to the alley before he does. Right. Pull him in there, take the sack, and that's all there is to it. Yes. That's all there is to it. Darling, I, are you sure you're okay? Honey, uh, <laughs> how can we lose? Hold it, buddy. <laughs> What? Just step inside here. Now you do what I what I tell you, or I'll I'll, I'll blow your head off. All right, all right, all right, all right. Just don't don't shoot. All right. Now, inside your right hand pocket, you uh you got a sack. I I do. Yeah. Now uh hand it over. All right. Now look. Don't 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 be nervous. Just just just. just. Shut up, okay? Well, that's a very big revolver. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah you just hand over the sack. You, you hear yeah, but, uh, but, but, but there's nothing in it, really. Well, I said hand it over.
over. All right, all right, all right. So don't be nervous. That, 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 that's it, that's it. You put your hand in your pocket and, and take it out again. Uh, slow, slowly, yeah. slow. That, that, that's it. All right. Hand it over. I'm good. Just what you say. Here it is. Don't shoot. That, now, now, turn around and start walking. Yeah. That, that, uh, 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 walk, walk down the street and, and keep walking. <laughs> Hello? Julie. Chris, where are you? In a phone booth. Where do you think? Oh, Chris, what happened? Did you do it? Oh, sure, I did it. Well, tell me. One dime. Chris. One thin, measly dime. Well, that, that, that must have been some mistake. And there sure was, and we made it. Oh, I, I'm sorry. You know what I did with that dime? I put it into the slot so I could call you up and tell you about it. But it only costs a nickel to make a phone call. Mm, that's what the operator told me. But I said, honey, you just keep the change. And so there it was, in the collection box of the pay telephone, our dime. And soon it will slip back into the huge and illimitable exchange of all the millions and billions of coins that are passed about daily from hand to hand. And if anybody ever stopped to look at it twice, we don't know. Because it was never heard of again. Every now and then, a patient and hard-working wife turns suddenly on her husband... I will not be taken for granted, she shouts. And forthwith, she A, murders him, B, leaves him, C, takes a lover, D, goes out and makes a glorious career for herself, E, any or all of the above. Being taken for granted and taking things for granted can result in fantastic losses. Just don't count your change. Look at your change. Our cast included Earl Hammond, Russell Horton, William Griffiths, Bryna Rayburn, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel. You can also visit my other YouTube channel by searching Mr. Brian McCarthy.